haven't seen it, uh, this podcast is really just meant to be used as a tool to provide information, resources, and awareness. Um, this is going to be a very sensitive topic, and so please take care of yourselves. You know, take that time if you do need to step away. We completely understand, and we don't want you to overextend emotionally or mentally just to be able to be present for this podcast. However, we do appreciate you being here and being able to help us facilitate this safe and open space for people to learn more about sexual violence and for people to be aware of how to identify it as well as how to help others who have been impacted in your lives or impacted in people you know's lives. Um, I would like to also say that this information provided on the podcast is not constituting professional advice, diagnosis, or treatment. It's not a replacement for supervision from mental health practitioners, school counselors, or other professionals. And you should always consult a licensed mental health professional before proceeding with treatment. That being said, we do have some content warnings for this episode. This podcast is going to be discussing sexual assault, harassment, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, anxiety, forms of sexual abuse, and sexual violence. And so with that in mind, you know, take what you would like to, but please, like I said, take care of yourselves. And I would like to, first of all, thank Damien for having me on the podcast tonight. I really appreciate the opportunity to get to use the platform and uh, be able to talk about this topic that I'm really passionate about and that it's basically what I'm working towards in my entire life. So it's really awesome. And I'm really glad to be able to be here. Yes, um, I guess, yeah, uh, I guess starting off. Oh, start. I'd start by just introducing yourself and talking about what you do. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So starting off, my name is Chris and I am a crisis advocate with a um, organization, a counseling agency called the Sexual Assault Resource Center. We're based in the Brazos Valley. However, um, we do help anybody who does call. If you do need any help and you end up calling us, we will provide that crisis intervention to you and provide you with the resources you need to get long-term counseling as well. I also have my bachelor's uh, in psychological and brain sciences, and I'm pursuing my master's in clinical mental health counseling as well. This being said, I do not currently have my license for professional counseling. However, I do have the four, four years of experience working as a crisis advocate with that sexual assault resource center. Yeah. Cool. All right. And thank you all for that, that little shout out and chat. I really appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I guess where I wanted to start besides introducing myself, saying hey, saying howdy, all that good stuff, um, was to let you know just that besides the content warnings and everything of the of that that topic, um, I do want to provide you some some little quick tips for some self care if you do need to step away at any point. Um, things that you might be able to do to help just ground yourself, especially if something does touch a little too close to home and you do need that time to take care of yourself. Um, one of the most common methods that we use when we're doing crisis um, intervention over the hotline is 54321 grounding. If um, any of you have been to any sort of therapy, uh, a lot of you may have heard of this before. It's a way to ground yourself when you're having a high moment of anxiety, where basically you start with five, five things that you can see. You list off five things you can see out loud to yourself or to someone else. Four things that you can touch. So whether that be, you know, the desk in front of you, the chair you're sitting in, different things that you can touch. Three things that you can hear two things that you can smell, and one thing you can taste. And so that goes through all your senses. It is just a way for you to take yourself out of your head for a moment and really ground yourself within your body and the moment that you're currently in rather than the uh, anxiety-filled situation that your brain is constructing. Dan, this is going to be another really heavy episode um very heavy topic so definitely 
take the time that you guys need to decompress and to um, recollect your energy afterwards, uh, regardless of if you've been um, in a situation where this affects you or not. The, the heaviness of the subject can still affect you without you even realizing it. So definitely take time to reflect on it before you um, take this anywhere else. And uh, if anyone has any questions throughout the episode, we'll be taking moments to answer questions. So just throw them into the chat and I will relay them to Chris. And when she's ready to take moments to answer questions, we'll be doing that as well. And yeah, this is this is only on Facebook. We're not doing this on Twitch today. Okay. All right. Yes. And then um, once again, you know, thank you all for being here. Really appreciate that. Um, I guess now is as good a time as any to get into the beginning. Okay. So I'd like to start off by. I guess, talking about sexual violence as a general topic, and then we'll get a little more focused as we move through the episode. But first of all, you know, sexual violence is a very broad term, and so what that can encompass is a lot of different things, and that can include, but is not limited to, rape, sexual trafficking, sexual harassment, unwanted sexual contact, stalking, reproductive coercion or control, revenge porn, flashing, and many other different things that are related to these uh, acts of violence. Um, this also does include any attempts on these acts as well. And so each of these acts is, or each of these um, experiences of sexual violence and experiences of attempted sexual violence are completely valid and um, impact every survivor in a different way. One thing I also probably should have touched on a moment ago, but that I will touch on now, is that you may hear me using slightly different language to discuss this topic, um, such as the term survivor when focusing on a person who may be identified as a victim of sexual violence. This is just due to the desire to promote a sense of control and a sense of empowerment for sexual assault survivors and sexual violence survivors. Um, especially because of the nature of the violence, there is a huge element to removing control and removing, re removing bodily autonomy from the survivor. And so using just positive language um, may be a small thing, but it is important. And so... That's, that's just one little note. Um, I also tend to use those who commit these acts. The term that I will use for this is going to be, you know, assailants or attackers or things such as that. That way I can encompass not only those who have committed um, one sexual violent act, but any, any assailant who may have contributed to any of these acts. And so moving back into our little definitions section. <laughs> um, this sexual violence can include all those things, um, and I do want to, I guess, emphasize that it is about power and control, these acts, and they're never really about simply desire. There may be that element of desire that fuels the initial, I guess, thought. However, the act itself is used to assert control and assert a domination over the survivor. Um, this is never, and I repeat, never the survivor's fault. Um, nothing that the survivor has said, done, worn, etc. It has never contributed to the um, survivor having had this act enacted on them. Um, and so... Yeah, those are just some some general stuff that I wanted to touch on. Um, I also wanted to touch on the types of survivors that can exist. There are two primary types, and that is going to be a primary survivor. So that is the person who the sexual violence was enacted on. So um, that is going to be 
the person who was raped or the person who was sexually harassed or anything like that. And there are also going to be what we call secondary survivors. Secondary survivors are not talked about as much, but this can basically just be anybody in the survivor's direct support system. So, for example, if a survivor was walking home from their partner's apartment at night and that's when the act happened, that partner may have this extreme guilt and anxiety regarding this act because they felt as though they could have done something, they weren't there, and thus it impacts them in very different ways but still to a severity that they are you know, requiring of treatment or um, need a consistent support system similar to a primary survivor. Um, this is not limited to romantic or sexual partners of survivors. This can be family members, best friends, um, you know, anything uh, where there's a close relationship between the primary survivor and the secondary survivor, especially when those extreme feelings of guilt, anxiety, um, and the like are involved. Um, but yeah, and so those are the different main types of survivors. And we um, like to make sure that, at least at SARC, which the Sexual Assault Resource Center, that's SARC, um, we provide treatment for both primary and secondary survivors because both of these types of survivors often require extensive treatment, um, whether that be individual group counseling or um, you know, short-term counseling uh, along with peer counseling groups later on. Um, but yeah, that's that's something that a lot of people don't know is that secondary survivor part um, because people often think of the primary survivor, but they don't think about their extremely close loved ones who feel that intense guilt and that intense um, regret regarding the situation. Um, and so we see a lot of those at Sark. Well, and a lot of those people also probably don't understand that they are affected the way they're affected and that they may need help too. So it's good to be yeah. able to put that out there and let people know. Um, because you never know who's been through what or anything like that, uh, especially even with me and some of the situations that I've recently found out about within my family, you know, I haven't ever really thought about it from that perspective. So that's definitely a good thing to understand. Yeah, of course. And I mean, I definitely want to emphasize that if you feel as though you may be a secondary survivor or even if you feel that you may be a primary survivor but you were unsure before, um, just take a moment to explore those feelings um, in a safe space. You know, Make sure that you are trying to validate whatever feelings are coming through you and allowing yourself to fully experience the um, negative or positive emotions you may be associating with the experience or your thoughts after. And especially with secondary survivors, I do want to emphasize that, you know, it's okay for secondary survivors to have those negative feelings. Um, you may feel initially as though you can't or you don't have a right to feel upset about the situation because it didn't happen to you. But um, that is definitely still something that we want to address and take care of because everybody's mental health is important and everybody is going to react to these situations in a different way. Um, but yes, I can definitely, so Jesus, um, we are going to discuss uh, how you can identify from the outside looking in a little bit later on. Um, but that is definitely a really good question. And um, we are definitely going to touch on that for identifying if it's been happening to your friends, family members, and also to children around you. So content warning for that as well. If you do have any experience or have children or anything like that, Please be mindful that we will be discussing um, some elements of child abuse as well. All right. And then, oh, sorry about that. No, you're good. 
I um, also want to go ahead and just at the top of all of this talk about men versus women being survivors. And I do obviously want to preface this by saying that there are people who identify outside of the gender binary and their experiences as a survivor are valid as well. However, there is a big stigma regarding um, male survivors versus female survivors and how they are treated when they come out with their stories or how they are treated prior to the attack thus leading to their reactions and emotional responses after the fact. Um, with men especially, there is a large stigma surrounding that men can't be survivors, they can't have this act enacted on them, you know. Um, the language usually used is like a, a man can't be a victim because they wanted it anyways or they, you know, they reacted physically and so they they truly weren't sexually assaulted which absolutely not um that is there there are plenty of survivors who have physical reactions to their assault unwillingly um just because uh, a lot of survivors actually state after the fact that their bodies had betrayed them in that moment um and whether or not the survivor is a male or a female or anywhere in between or outside, um, if there wasn't consent, then it wasn't okay. Period. There is nothing that can change that. And so I just wanted to address that as well. And the general stigma around that, um, especially with those male survivors um, and with the stigma surrounding male survivors after the fact in how men are typically socialized to externalize their issues. Um, what that basically means is that women are socialized to internalize, or internalize their issues, you know, keep quiet, um, kind of let themselves feel, but um, do it in a more personal way method whereas men are encouraged to externalize their feelings so don't let anybody see what you're feeling um but you know go boxing let it all out or um go get on some sort of sports field and you know let out your anger that way or let out your emotions through more physical means versus expressing your emotions verbally or expressing them physically, whether that be, you know, crying, yelling, anything of the sort, um, both of which are just a result of how our society has decided to socialize their children. And um, they have impacted male survivors, I would say, in my experience with the clients I have um, counseled I would say it would impact those male survivors um, unequally. I'm, I'm forgetting the word for that. Disproportionately, that's it. Um, but I would say that it has definitely impacted the male survivors I've spoken to disproportionately just with the fact that they don't want to report for those reasons um, because they may be seen as less of a man or less tough, less... Um, less strong because they've been overpowered in that moment or taken advantage of in those moments. And then surrounding women, there is a whole different set of stigmas, especially concerning false reporting and the use of, you know, the he said, she said uh, kind of dialogue that surrounds rape and sexual assault and harassment, whether that be, you know, in the workplace or outside, there has always been this sense of, you know, who are you going to believe and why would I believe her if she doesn't have any proof? Um, and so that is something that keeps a lot of women from reporting because they fear that if they do report, no one will believe them or that if they do report that they'll, I guess, lose in a way, um, that they will you know, go through all this pain of reporting and go through all the pain of going through trial or going through an HR case, depending on the context of the situation, um, and still not getting validated or the uh, assailant walking free. Mm -hmm. And within those, the context of reporting, 
Um, this may not be common knowledge. I'm not sure uh, if this is common knowledge or not, but I want to touch on it just in case it isn't because I'm sure there's someone out there that doesn't know. But within the context of reporting, um, the common reporting process is, you know, a call or walking in to a police department. Um, but that is not the only time that a survivor needs to tell their story. And each time that the survivor is talking through the story of what happened to them, who did it, and how they did it, they have to relive this situation. And oftentimes, a lot of survivors, when they report to a police department, will have to report the same story to multiple officers over and over and over again prior to even getting to a trial. And then if a trial does happen, they have to report the same story to their legal representation as well as to the court. And they may even be cross-examined on this testimony uh, where the opposing counsel will ask them like, oh, but are you sure that that really happened? Are you sure that that happened the way that you said that it happened? Poking holes into the story that the survivor has had to relive for you know, months and months and months uh, after the attack and after this has happened to them, especially with courts being so long and drawn out um, with some court cases not even going to trial until years after the initial report or years after the initial attack was made. Yeah, and that's like repeat, repeated... Uh going going through it in your head over and over is also not just uh in court but it's already something that happens with trauma as it is with obsessive thinking and it's something okay. that a lot of people struggle to get away from so like uh, i i know a big part of the struggle with trauma is getting away from that obsessive thinking and one thing that combats that in a way is um having to go back into it um so a lot of people probably don't report because they don't want to get into it or they don't want to face what happened mm -hmm. so i is that like something you have to deal with often is um maybe like helping uh survivors approach reporting it yes so with the crisis intervention we give um not only are we talking the survivors down from the proverbial ledge but we are also providing them the resources so that they know all their options because a big part of counseling sexual assault survivors is giving them as many options as possible and giving them as much control over the process as possible. As a counselor, we're a non-reporting um, agency, a non-reporting person, and so whenever a client goes to us and discusses their sexual assault experiences, then there is no mandate to report and thus there is kind of that safe space of being able to discuss your options whether that be i want to report it through my local university because it happened on campus or i want to report it through the local police department because you know that's that's it happened in this city and i'd like to report it through them or i wouldn't like to report at all i would just like to pursue treatment um, because each of those options has a lot of different aspects to it with the reporting process you know Schools take it a lot differently than a regular court system would. Um, and with not reporting, a lot of survivors choose not to just because they don't have evidence, they fear that they don't or that they won't be believed, or they fear that confrontation of those repeated thoughts, that repeated experience over and over again. And that confrontation of their assailant, because... Yeah, I mean, maybe yeah. having to face them again. Mm -hmm. um, right. And not many survivors are willing to go and sit in a courtroom with your assailant for an extended period of time, um, which is completely understandable, and that is completely their choice. Um, <clears throat> I did uh, kind of want to support all of this with not only my experiences but some statistics and um, this is from the National Sexual Violence Resource Center um, and so there are 
one in five women who um, have experienced completed or attempted rape during their lifetime. There are one in three women who have experienced sexual violence in their lifetime. And there are one in four um, men who have experienced uh, completed or attempted rape. And this is also uh, one in four men who have experienced this between the ages of 11 and 17. Um, the, the ages of 11 and 17 uh, also go for women with one in three. So if you, yeah, if you think that this isn't very common, it's a very common issue, unfortunately. And um, one thing that I didn't realize before coming into this field was, you know, I saw these numbers. I, I went to my university for my bachelor's and they had their whole freshman orientation with their, you know, sexual assault presentation as a part of it, you know, how to report and how to recognize it and what are the different kinds of sexual violence and what you can do, you know, stand up, say something. Um, but even then, you know, myself, I sat in that lecture or the, the presentation and one in three sounds like very common, but also one in three was just a number. It wasn't anything that felt tangible. Um, but as I got further into my college career, um, especially when I became an RA, I met residents who came to me with their um, report and at that time I was a mandatory reporter and um, and so I didn't get to provide the survivors with all the options that I might have been able to if I wasn't in that position um, and then not only did my residents come to me but friends of mine uh, told me of their experience, co-workers of mine told me of their experiences with sexual violence, whether that had been stalking or rape or harassment within the workplace or anything of the, of the sort. Um, and for me, that definitely contextualized that one in three number for women and that one in four number for men of right. that these, these aren't just numbers. These are people in your lives. If you have the thought that no one in your life has been touched by this or impacted by sexual violence. Maybe they just haven't told you. Yeah. And it's something that was hard for me to reconcile, you know, as a 17 year old freshman in college, I didn't, I, that didn't really click in my brain, but um, going forward, hearing more stories and, you know, becoming involved in this uh, counseling agency that I work for and, you know, getting my degree in psycho psychological and brain sciences, um, it, it made it real. Um, because when, you know, someone comes to you with their story and you see how it's impacted them, they are no longer that one in three or one in four. They are your friend, your sister, your cousin, your coworker, your neighbor, they are a real person who you see every day and you see them you see them go to class, go to work, run errands, you know, proceed about their normal lives without ever knowing that that is something that they've experienced and that is something that they have had to go through and had to have that traumatic experience. So when someone comes up to you and um, I guess presents to you this experience, whatever it may be. What is the what is the the go to um, way to, I guess, provide comfort, but also encourage them to get the help they need? Because you know, obviously, they're talking. They could be talking to you because you have experience in it, right? But if they, like, let's say, someone came up to me, um, <laughs> in fact, in recent history, someone did come up to me and, um, they didn't tell me exactly what happened, but they made it clear something had happened. And, um, I guess for, for him specifically, it was like, if he talked about it, it would have ruined his day entirely, completely shattered everything for the day. And so like, I've only one time when he tried to approach me, you know, cause I've, I care about him a lot. So I was like, 
I guess trying to find out what happened or like let him open up to me, but he couldn't because he basically said it would just ruin his whole day and he wasn't trying to have a bad day. So what is, what is, uh, what could I have done differently, I guess, or how could I have approached that to provide a sense of comfort in, in allowing him to know that I'm there? Yeah. Um, it's definitely going to be difficult for people to open up to those around them. Um, like I said, that fear of not being believed or, uh, anything um, along those lines is very real. Um, one thing that, or I guess a couple things you can say, um, if somebody does come to you with their experience is um, saying that, you know, you hear them and that you believe them. That's super important is to acknowledge that not only they're saying something happened to them, but you truly and honestly believe that they have gone through this experience and that um, this person that has assaulted them, whether that be somebody you don't know or whether that be your best friend, you show that you are supporting that survivor through that. Um, you also want to make sure that you express that they're not alone, that um, even if you know you haven't gone through this personally, you are still there for them, um, whether that be you know helping them, calm down from anxiety at the moment or whether that be, you know, a call in the middle of the night when they need somebody to talk to, um, expressing that, you know, they have that support from you and that they have other support systems as well. Um, say if, you know, this person who came to you, um, if you were all in a big friend group, you know, and you know that they're especially close to you and another person in the friend group, then express that, you know, even if, even if Jake doesn't know what you're going through, Jake's one of your best friends. He cares for you, and you know if you call him and say that you're having a rough day, he'll be there for you. Um, letting them know that they have that solid support system is really important because this sexual violence in general is going to push a lot of survivors into this back corner where they feel like they're alone and powerless. And so that's an extremely important thing. And also... This seems pretty obvious, but just in case, letting them know that it wasn't their fault is extremely important. Um, you know, a lot of uh, a lot of survivors I have spoken to personally. You know, there have been survivors who've called me on the crisis hotline, um, saying that you know their the person they were married to was doing this to them, um, and they were saying, you know, why did I marry them? But they they obviously married them with some sort of expectation of safety and loving compassion and caring and not with the expectation that they would have to experience continued sexual violence throughout their marriage and so you know you have to remind that person that it's it's not their fault they they did not make a mistake that led to this in particular um this was completely at the hands of the assailant and not at all whether they were dressed in a turtleneck and uh you know long corduroy pants or wearing you know a swimsuit nothing nothing is ever going to make it the survivor's fault i would also recommend that you know depending on the survivor's state of mind um kind of get a gauge on them a feel on how heightened their anxiety is you know whether or not they're willing to further further discuss it um, you know, don't push too much because like you said, you know, the, the person who came to you didn't want to get into it because they didn't want to have a bad day. And that's understandable. You don't want to push them because that's just going to increase their obsessive thinking and increase right. the amount of thoughts they're going to have throughout the rest of the day. So would you say but, it's better to approach distracting? Um, I honestly, it kind of depends on the the state of the survivor. So in your case, I would definitely say um, providing that, you know, affirmation of support, um, that validation of, you know, if you do want to talk further about this, I'm here. Um, and also letting them know that you are there to help. But if they don't want to talk about it, don't, don't make them. So yeah, yeah. talk about something else. 
or you know if they want to end the conversation allow them to end that conversation allow them to have that control over when they tell you everything because this is completely an experience of a lack of control and so everything you do when you're supporting them you want to give them these options and that sense of control over their healing process if they do seem a little more ready to talk about it or if they don't want to talk about the details but they kind of tell you like I was sexually harassed at work last week, you know, then if they give you a little something, ask them what you can do to help them, you know, whether that be a attending, you know, or not attending, but going with them to report it to the local police department or going with them to um, report it to their school, their work, um, or just being there for them uh, in that moment, you know, letting them vent to you, letting them rant, and um, making sure that they're not spiraling out of control. Um, you definitely want to take those moments to listen and kind of just focus on not only their words, but their emotional reactions to what they're saying. Because if they're saying, you know, that, they're having a great day, but you can see that there are tears in their eyes and they're kind of um, bubbling up with this emotion, then, you know, you want to help them get down, get calm, and um, provide them with a way to get out of their head in that moment. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, I think that, you know, you didn't do anything wrong by not pushing. Um, that's definitely the right thing to do in that situation. Um, and just letting them know that you're there for them, providing that support. And when they're ready to talk to you, letting them know that they still can and that you believe them and that you, you care for them. Yeah. And so, yeah, that, that, that's just a couple of things that you can do. Um, if a survivor does come to you with these experiences um, and wants to talk about it, um, I, would, I would definitely, you know, be their support system if you are emotionally available to. You also have to keep in mind your own limitations because... If you yourself are a primary or secondary survivor and that conversation may be too much for you, you know, help manage yourself as well as, you know, doing your best to support that, that friend or that family member or that partner um, through their opening up to you. Um, make sure that, you know, if you have a strong opinion, I guess, of... Um, the assailant or what the survivor needs to do don't push it down their throat um you know let them know if they if they ask for your advice you know i would say then it's appropriate to provide it in a calm way you know letting them know like hey this is what i think but also letting them know that you're not telling them what to do um because the survivor may ask you know what do you think about this, um, you know, in a fluster of emotion and then hearing you say like, oh, well, you have to report it, then provides that extra pressure every single moment that they haven't reported it of, well, am I doing something wrong by not reporting it? You know, like, how, how is this going to impact, you know, me and how is that going to impact any future um, survivors who may encounter him or who may be victimized by him or her in the future um, right. because that survivor while the report may lead to some sort of conviction or punishment um, it also may not and that survivor recognizes that risk and there's a real fear there um, and so, you know, if the survivor chooses not to report, they don't need um, their support system that they came to to be like, well, why, why didn't you do that? You know, why didn't you tell somebody about it? Um, even if you are genuinely curious, you know, it can just be seen as judging and invalidating of their experiences, which is just 
not exactly the best way to <laughs> continue to be that support system for that person um, right. because it destroys that foundation of trust, you know? I think for, because we, we've had discussions in the past, in past episodes about nonviolent communication and uh, mm -hmm. a big part of that was listening and how to nonviolently listen. And I think a big part of that um, could come into play with this. If, if someone's approaching you about their story, um, one big thing being the listener is validating that you're listening in, in that you, uh, you can take what they're saying and kind of repeat it to them and be like, so basically like this and this and this happened and this made you feel like this. That way they have a comprehension that you're actually listening to them. But um, in the moments that you feel like you don't have a response, that is that still like a valid thing with this situation? Or would you avoid directly discussing what, what they're experiencing? So I can definitely understand the sentiment behind, you know, maybe not discussing it. Um, However, a lot of survivors, I will not say every survivor because each person is, you know, different, individual, unique. Um, however, a lot of survivors, if they're coming to you with this experience, don't want to be wrapped in bubble wrap. Um, they don't want you to treat them differently. You know, if you, uh, if, if your cousin came to you with this information that they had been sexually assaulted, um, and you normally hug them every time you see them, but the next time you see them after you tell them, or after they tell you, you don't hug them because, you know, what if it triggers them? While you may be coming from a good place of heart, um, you know, that person has gone through this major change in their life and needs their people to stay constant. And so if you are trying to use that nonviolent communication and, you know, kind of echoing them to validate their experience and also let them know that you're actively listening, I would definitely, you know, maybe not repeat the exact details if they tell you, you know, and then they did this to me. Um, you know, maybe don't repeat the exact gruesome details of the uh, incident, but right. letting them know, like, okay, and so, you know, they, they attacked you and you felt scared and, you know, like like kind of generalizing it a little more if you're going to be using that echoing language so i think one other big thing for me um is basically when when you're approaching this right especially let's say you're about to engage in a, a romantic relationship with someone who is a survivor um mm -hmm. how do you go about approaching um, learning about triggers so that you know so, what a safe space is. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, there's always Google, but the thing about Google is that, you know, it's going to give you a list of potential triggers for sexual assault survivors, but that may not be your person's triggers. So, right. you know, if you are engaging in a new relationship with your partner and they open up to you, you know, saying that they've experienced um, some sort of sexual violence. If they give you any details about the attack or anything like that, um, I would say kind of keep it in mind, but don't alter your behavior unless, um, you know, it's explicitly like, oh yeah, and every time they were going to assault me, they flick the lights off twice probably don't flick the lights off twice but um <laughs> yeah <laughs> if they, but you know if if they if they haven't expressed to you that your behavior is triggering them like i said survivors often want you to stay a constant in their life they don't want you to treat them like they're made of glass um because you know they may have days where they feel more triggered by certain actions and in those cases, you would want to have facilitated open and honest communication prior to the fact or during the fact, um, letting them know that you know, you're here to listen and you are here to be there for them. Um, and if they want to express to you what triggered them, 
allow them to do so. If they don't want to, you know, that that's their choice and that's completely um, valid on their part. I would say definitely from the get-go, as soon as you know that you're going to be approaching a relationship with anybody, you should be facilitating open and honest communication between yourself and them on both sides, you know, two-way street. Um, that way, if they do come to you with these uh, experiences, then they feel that you have had this history of listening to them and, you know, not only listening to what they're saying in the moment, but taking what they've said and, you know, if they, if you, if they say, like, oh, you know, uh, having uh, the coats by the door really bothers me um, and you move the coats by the door, you know, then that, or you move the coats from their spot by the door to somewhere else, you know, that is showing that you have taken what they said and you are validating listening to, it. listening and validating, yeah. Um, and so when those topics of sexual assault and um, previous history of sexual assault come in, you know, just expressing that communication is key. And um, if you, if the conversation is in a way where they're not super emotional at the time, you know, they just are talking to you to let you know, um, then feel free to ask them. If they don't want to talk about it, they don't want to talk about it, but at least you asked. Um, and you have set forth that, you know, you are aware that there may be triggers that come up in the future. And that they have the option to provide those to you, um, especially if they do have specific triggers. I do also want to mention that if you are engaging in a relationship, whether that's a friendship, romantic relationship, sexual relationship with any survivor, um, there are days where they're triggered by nothing. There are going to be days where it's just a bad day and they are experiencing that you know, obsessive thought pattern or that spiraling. And it's not because someone, you know, uh, it's not because someone hugged them a little too tight or because someone, you know, bumped into them and accidentally touched them somewhere. Uh, you know, it could be the littlest thing. It could be someone on TV having the same name as their assailant. And those aren't some, those aren't things you can control, but making sure that when those do come up and you are around the person and you notice that, you know, they're getting into that spiraling state, they're getting into that obsessive state, talking them down from it, providing those grounding techniques, um, whether that be the five, four, three, two, one, one that um, we talked about earlier, or, you know, any other grounding techniques that you might know. I'll also get a, go over some at the end, um, just providing more ways where you can calm down or provide a way for your friend, partner, cousin, neighbor to calm down. Um, but yeah, did that answer your question? I feel like I talked a lot. Yeah, no, um, that's good. Um, okay. um, I'm, I'm at a much like a very beginner perspective with a lot of it. Um, so, mm -hmm. you know, like you say, there's one in three. I'm one of the people that don't even realize a lot of the time with the people around me, like, um, one of them being my brother who I've known my entire life and didn't know about anything he's experienced until just very recently. So it's very, uh, for me, I'm, I'm in a place where I just want to know how I can approach, um, helping or comforting him if he does reach out or does need it. But it's also like, I've, I guess I've just given him space because that seems to be what he needs um, in, in that retrospect. Like he, he needs me to be that constant, like you said, which is making sense, yeah. you know, just acting the same way that I always act and being his brother, uh, act, acting like I acted before I knew about it. And, and I think that has a lot to do with control because if you look at uh, a survivor and think that they're a different person, um, than they were before that affects their amount of control that they have over any, you know, over your relationship with each other now, because that's put a perspective that what happened made them who they are now, as opposed to them having control over who they are. So it makes a lot of sense to, to provide that, um, 
be yourself energy with anyone that has gone through it. So that's something that, cause I, you know, a lot of people, uh, I know for me, it's like, you think about it cause you've never been through it or you don't know what it is to go through it. And you, you're not really a professional. You haven't been trained and you think that it, it needs some sort of special treatment or some sort of, let me set some eggs aside. Um, you know, or like, let me tiptoe around so that I'm not stepping on these eggshells. But, um, that does more damage than, than what it would be if you just be yourself for them still and be there for them in the way that you, you always have. So that definitely applies a lot of perspective for me. And I'm sure many people in chat also have that, um, you know, that cause it, it's such a touchy subject and there's such a stigma built around it that, um, people don't talk about it and it's not something that, like, cause I, I, I mean, I don't even in, like in my community, I have so many people, um, while I'm streaming that will come in and that they, they feel safe to discuss their depression or their anxiety or the things they're going through or the people they've lost, um, or even bad things that happen to them. But if it's something sexual, it doesn't get discussed. It doesn't get put on the table. And that obviously has a lot to do with control, but it also, um, you know, I, I feel like uh, people need need that safe space regardless of what they're going through. And so um, I know at some point you'll give more resources on on if there are survivors that, that haven't quite found the help they need, how they can go about finding that and everything as well, which is definitely important. But it applies a direct perspective to me, especially seeing... Um, even in the chat right now, just viewers that have opened up about their situations and their experiences. Um, it just goes to show because like a lot of people may not know that about about these people. And the, the fact that they're willing to come in here and open up about their story just shows the 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 safe space that we're trying to create in this community with this podcast is something that people are accepting which is a very good feeling for me um because people deserve that space and you just you know anyone and everyone deserves to be able to tell their story and to be able to um be proud of who they are and to be able to move forward and, and use their story to help others if they feel like they need to and i mean i I also uh, was scrolling through chat and everything, and I want to say to everybody who has expressed their own stories or their um, you know, their stories that they have heard from their friends, their family members, um, that you know everything that you have said and everything that you may have felt or or are feeling as you listen to this podcast um, is completely normal, and we are just trying to go through this podcast uh, as sensitively as we can as to not provoke any um, spiraling or obsessive thinking within you guys, but also we want to provide this safe space for you to open up and to reach out um, to the rest of the community, especially because, you know, as I'm sure you guys can see as you scroll through chat, you're not alone. And, you know, there are your fellow viewers and your friends who you've made through chat and you know your friends who you may be making um, who have gone through similar things or know people who have gone through similar things and are all willing to help and be there for you um, and even just having the courage to share your story is helping um, and so thank you to everybody who has opened up in chat so far obviously if you are watching and you would not like to open up that is also totally okay you're not hurting anybody by keeping your story private um these are you know all completely up to you and we want to make sure that if you do feel as though you need to share please you know feel free um and let us know how we can support you um and I hope that this can provide you with some more information or some more techniques to helping you 
heal and go forward. Um, but yeah, if uh, you haven't already thought about seeking professional treatment, um, whether that be through short-term, long-term counseling, um, like I said earlier, this podcast, while it is a great forum for spreading awareness, information, and educating, um, you know, it's not going to be that substitute for counseling and for really approaching those um, those experiences and those thought patterns on a deeper level with a counselor. Um, and so just wanted to um, discuss that as well. I guess there, and, there is like one other side perspective um, mm -hmm. that it's definitely more of a touchy side, but you know, with, with that whole statistic of one in four and one in three, um, that also applies to assailants and um, there there is definitely situations where people you may know may be an assailant um, and so I guess you know if there's someone you really care about but but they're an assailant um, in any way shape or form there there's got to be a way to approach that right and to be able to um, because there there is help for them as well um, I, I remember so I I had to go to um, outpatient rehab um, after I got arrested for weed. And my counselor in rehab was actually before that um, a therapist for uh, sexual assault assailants, not, not the survivors. And she explained it in a very weird way. She enjoyed her job a lot because um, she really felt like she was leaving an imprint that needed to be made um, in helping um, not only... Um, you know, rapists, but pedophiles in uh, overcoming the sickness that was their pedophilia or whatever it may have been. And, mm -hmm. you know, while we hate that, I think anyone can say the word hate when it comes to a perspective on seeing a pedophile. Um, mm -hmm. It's also important to understand that the brain is an organ and it can fail you. And that, um, it, you know, you're not always going to be able to put these people in jail, right? So that there's other steps that people can take towards maybe getting these people help so that kids in the future or um, survivors in the future aren't affected by maybe one more person because this person happened to go get help. So I think, um, it, I guess the question out of that would be, let's say you know someone, and it doesn't have to be a specific sexual assault it doesn't have to be like children or whatever it may be obviously the first thing you want to do is be you know if there's evidence or something happened or you know for a fact you're, you're going to want to report it right but mm -hmm. if you're in a situation where there is no option to report right like let's say there's no evidence there's no nothing how would you know maybe how would you go about approaching getting this person to get help for themselves before something happens to someone else so I would definitely say that um, it's, it's going to be a tough conversation. Um, obviously, you know, if you do know someone who is maybe thinking of becoming an assailant or they're may have been, you know, a rumor where there's no evidence or, you know, things like that where a report can't be made, um, then you have to consider, um, are you willing to be the person to help this person? And, you know, are, can, can you mentally and emotionally bear that burden? Because, uh, it's, it's going to be rough and it is not something that is easy, especially with um, things such as pedophilia. Uh, they are not going to, a, a lot of people who are assailants or um, have thought about becoming an assailant um, are not going to see an issue with their actions or they are not going to see a way of being helped, um, whether that is just due to thinking that they're broken or thinking that they're entitled to doing what they have thought about doing or have done in the past. Um, I think that the, the first thing is 
means definitely to express that the behavior that they are committing or thinking of is absolutely not okay and that there needs to be some seeking of help before people get hurt. Um, I think that if... I guess um, a lot of it is going to come before you find out, um, if that makes sense. So, you know, if your friend has been making a lot of jokes about rape and, you know, they kind of... Are desensitized. De yeah, they're desensitizing this action, and so they may not consciously, they may consciously understand that, you know, rape is against the law and immoral in the eyes of society, but, you know, after you've become desensitized, whether through your experiences or through, you know, a misfiring in your brain where you can't understand it, then, um, you know, there needs to be that social repercussion of, you know, that's that's kind of the whole discussion with uh, social media of encouraging your friends to not talk about men or women a certain way. Um, you know, encouraging, I guess, better behavior, um, to put it, to put it uh, in Lincoln's terms, you know, um, normalizing that desensitization of those rape jokes those you know sexual violence jokes that's just going to make them think that those thoughts that they're having and those actions that they may or may not have already committed are no big deal you know right. um oh well you know my 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 girlfriends joked about it all the time so it's it's not uh, a big deal if i push my boyfriend into having sex or you know my guy friends are always joking about how, you know, men are the dominating ones and how um, we, we take what we get. And so I'm going to take what I get. Um, and so it really starts from that point of correcting any un or any, any miss socialization. So any socialization that's happened in the past that makes them think that the behavior's okay or that the thoughts are okay. Um, and then encouraging them to get help. Um, if you know of any counselors in the area who are specifically um, focused in that, then, you know, providing those resources to them. But ultimately, you know, you're not going to be able to save everyone. And right. I think that's like a, a harder part of it to approach. And I know that's not like, yeah. so to speak, your specialty in, <laughs> in that you're not dealing with assailants on a daily basis, but it's something that people don't think about because it could be your best friend. It could be your dad. It could be anyone that you care about that is an assailant. And um, I guess if that were the case, you have to come to a point where, um, well, what are you going to do? And I think one thing I learned through a lot of the trauma that I've experienced and stuff is in the calmer moments, um, you can find a, an ability to think on these things and, you know, prepare um, for what you would do in a situation. For, so, for example, like if you're approaching obsessive thinking, well, in the moments that you're not obsessive thinking and you're in a calm state of mind or you're having a good time, you can start a process of planning what to do next time you have obsessive thinking. So like, um, as opposed to, you know, cause a lot of people might look at the perspective of, well, they did this, so they're wrong. And then if you're trying to help them, then you're just as wrong as them. But it may not be that you're trying to help them. It may be that you're trying to prevent anything from happening further in the future to other people that wouldn't deserve that happening to them, especially if there's a situation where you can't report. Right. Yeah. So I think yeah. it, it provides a perspective, especially um, in the day and age that we're living in with, I think a huge example is the the Netflix series, 13 Reasons Why. Um, I think there's a lot in there about sexual assault that um, they cover as a TV show, but in a way uh, it's very romanticized 
all of it, like everything that happens. Um, and it's definitely like a concept, especially with our youth and people that may be high school age now that they may not know how to deal with things and they may, you know, they, uh, I know for me, I watch shows that I like. And when I was younger, it definitely affected how I acted. Right. So if someone watches this, you know, 13 reasons why, and then you see the specific scene where there's the two high school jocks and his girlfriend's hammered in bed and he like pushes him out of the way to go into the room and then rapes his girlfriend. Um, there's a lot of, uh, guilt for the, the one jock because he kind of let it happen. But then, mm -hmm. you know, what, what does that portray for uh, our youth if something like that happens and how can they, you know, stand up and pre-plan? So that's kind of where I was getting at with it is like, if you reach a point where obviously the number one thing you should do is put your foot down and um, not allow these things to happen right in front of you or do whatever you have to do, call the cops, whatever it may be. Um, mm -hmm. But in the situations where you can't report, obviously, because it, it could be any given situation. It could be some guy um, that's your, one of your homies just happens to be like, yeah, so I did this. Right. But if there's no evidence or anything, then how do you, you can't even go about reporting that. But there has to be something you can do to prevent it in the future or, you know, maybe you do just step away from it. Um, or like you said, uh, social repercussions, which is like, I guess, you know, going around and telling people, hey, this is something this person did and they literally told me, you know. Mm -hmm. So I think that there's perspectives on both sides um, where you have to be able to, um, you know, you want to be there for survivors. But then you also, I think some people want to do more than just be there for survivors. They want to do more for the cause. They want to do something that um, really affects the numbers um, in some way, shape, or form to where less people are suffering from from this situation. And, you know, and that I think that's a big reason you probably became an advocate was because you wanted to be able to actually affect these numbers and actually um, help these people that have been through it but also um obviously i think the big goal is to find a way to to prevent it um when it is preventable so yeah. a lot and of people I, don't see that side no i i completely uh i completely understand um kind of wanting to approach it in a different way because you do have to think that you know this this isn't just something that happens to people somebody did this um and, you know, like I said, you know, you're not going to be able to save everybody. Um, and so those social repercussions are a way when there is no way to report to discourage the behavior. Um, but ultimately, you know, it's, it's in that person's hands of are they going to continue to do this or are they going to seek corrective action um and i also want to note kind of on just the the note of social repercussions that obviously there is something to be said about approaching it carefully um because you know if you hear some sort of rumor that some, one of your friends or your family members or um something happened to somebody at the hands of somebody you know, you know, there, there can be damage done if there is no kind of verification of mm -hmm. that. Especially um, with cancel culture. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the sentiment behind cancel culture, especially in regards to sexual violence, you know, People are trying to go at it from a good place. You know, they're saying, you know, there has to be social repercussions for these in, in you know, um, inexcusable social or sexual acts. And, you know, there has to be some sort of punishment when no punishment can really be given because there is that no proof for um, something along those lines. But, you know, there is there is a point where it's verification and then there's a point where it's invalidation of the survivor's experience as well. Um, because, you know, if you hear from 
Tony that uh, his bre- best friend Jake uh, raped someone, then are you know how do you approach going about giving those social repercussions or you know do you talk to Tony again? Do you talk to Jake? Um, if Jake assaulted someone you know, do you talk to them and see what happened? Um, there is definitely some amount of just sensitivity that you have to go about it with um, and making sure that you're not just going up to the person that they assaulted and being like, hey, you know, uh, I heard you were saying some stuff about my my homie. Um, Like, what's going on with that? Why would you try to destroy his reputation like this? But also, you know, kids are fucking mean. (laughs) Kids are fucking mean. That's yeah. just real shit. There's a lot of situations where you could be trying to do the right thing and um, the wrong people get their hands on it and, and turn your life upside down. So, so yeah. you know, sometimes it is better to just step away from a situation or step away from um, what could potentially damage you. But um, and that's the, I think that's the harder part of it all is um, the lack of justice, the the inability to bring justice to these situations. And by justice, I mean like actual consequences for when someone does something that they should not do to someone uh, without consent or whatever it may be. Um, And, you know, there's only so much we can do to stand up for what's right. And there's only so much we can do to be there for survivors. But, um, you know, that I think that's touching base on, as far as we, we went from types of survivors all the way through to um, how we can help and comfort or how we can encourage uh, assailants even to get help. But I think the the, the next topic to jump into was, um, I guess, preventative measures. So how can we, uh, what are the, the signs, the red flags, not just in, you know, um, I guess because I I feel like the red flags would probably be different based on age. Like uh, I'm sure there's situations where there's people that are seniors living in a nursing home that are assaulted, but then there's also little kids that get assaulted and then everything in between, you know? So Mm -hmm. what what are the red flags to look for, I guess, um, that you know of or in each category so that um, at least you know some idea of, if something might be happening and then what are the ways to approach preventing those or, or, um, I guess I ultimately not allowing something to happen. Yeah. Um, yeah. So there, this is going back to Jesus's question from earlier, you know, that, uh, how as a person on the outside looking in, can you, try and identify that, you know, whether it's within your friend group or your family. Um, if you're looking to see, you know, if anybody needs help, if there's those silent cries for help, how do you find them? Um, and it is going to be different for everybody, but there are some general signs that you can look for. Um, what I want to touch on first, I guess, is going to be, uh, the, child aspect of it um and then moving into the adults in your life who may have experienced this as well um but so i i will go ahead and preface this as well with the clientele that i work with are uh of you know the age of consent and older uh we typically outsource um all services for those who are underage to another wonderful organization called Scotty's House. Um, They help domestic abuse and sexual abuse uh, victims who are underage, um, and they have done some amazing work within the Brazos Valley regarding this. But um, I did go ahead and do research ahead of time for this, um, and so most of the stuff that I'm pulling is going to be from RAIN. Um, That's the nation's largest anti-sexual violence organization. Um, It's Rain with Two Ends. And uh, if you would like to look at their website and everything, they have a bunch of amazing resources um, regarding sexual violence and um, just any any warning signs as well as um, different statistics and resources. Um, 
and so for children specifically um if you are looking for red flags for children in your life who are being assaulted or abused um then there are some common symptoms um and that's going to be some of these things so i have a list here um so that's going to be you know suddenly keeping secrets if your child is very open and honest with you normally but suddenly they just don't want to talk to you and um this is especially prevalent in younger children because you know as children grow older and they get into that adolescent stage there's obviously going to be a shift in how much information they share with their parents just due to the kind of social expectations of how adolescents interact with their parents but with younger children um you know especially when they have been more open and they just suddenly stop there's nothing going on to your knowledge but you know they suddenly stop talking to you about things they don't want to talk about um you know the time they spend out of the house um then that is something to look for um also overly compliant behavior so if you know your child or a child in your life is normally you know obviously there are going to be those kids who typically listen to their parents first time and there's going to be those kids who don't listen to their parents first time but you know, if you notice that they are complying when they normally wouldn't have and not because there's the threat of time out on the table but just out of the ordinary you know if um you know if your daughter didn't want to go to bed and she normally doesn't want to go to bed um and then suddenly one day you say like hey you know it's time to it's time to go to bed and she was like okay and just like ran into her room and like was kind of scared of the repercussions of not listening to you um then you know that can be a warning sign for some sort of abuse happening um there's also one big thing is regressive behavior um this can apply to children that are very young as well as older children um so that regressive behavior is basically just talking about like thumb sucking bedwetting um you know being overly attached to an old stuffed animal that they haven't really been attached to um suddenly having an imaginary friend once they're past the age of kind of getting through that um things like that so if you see that they haven't sucked their thumb for seven years and now have started again there is that there's likely that increased anxiety coming from somewhere and that can be um one of the signs of that as well inappropriate sexual behavior um so anything outside of the normal realm of curiosity and kids being kids um if there is that inappropriate sexual behavior that could be due to someone showing them that behavior and teaching them that that is what they should be doing um avoiding the removal of clothing or bathing especially for younger children who still need help at bedtime you know changing out of their clothes getting into the bath and everything like that um if they suddenly don't want to there may be a reason there um not wanting to be left alone with other adults even if it isn't just a specific adult but just not wanting to be left alone with anybody except the primary caregivers um there is also uh, a decrease in confidence increased aggression and then one thing that is a little uh less expected is an increase in health issues um and so not just things that could be related to you know sexually transmitted diseases but also just you know an increase of um stomach issues you know an increase of headaches or you know something that the child isn't normally prone to um that increase in health issues you know if you are an adult who has experienced a lot of stress you may notice that you know you get a cold right when you're really stressed or you are suddenly really nauseous like and you've been stressed out the past few days and you're like oh i'm sick because i'm stressed it's the same for a child um they just don't know how to express that that's the reason that they've been getting sick um and so that's something to look for as well you know obviously there are going to be situations where these symptoms appear because of other things and so you know if you see your kid suddenly get a cold but they just started a new school right maybe take that into account as well um and you know obviously well and it can also never see... hurt to approach therapy regardless if you have um 
concerns. Yeah, if you do have concerns, you know, definitely um, try and have a discussion with the child. If it is your child, um, have an open and honest discussion. If not, maybe express your concerns to the parents unless there is the kind of suspicion that their primary caregivers are the ones that are um, doing this to them. And so I did also write down some stuff on how you can look for red flags in adults who may be uh, enacting this sexual violence on children. And so, you know, if there is a suspicious adult figure in your child's life or another child you know's life, um, looking for these red flags can be helpful as well. Um, and so, you know, things like making up excuses to be alone with the child, um, gift giving excessively when there's no occasion. So, you know, um, if it's the child's birthday or if it was recently the child's birthday, that's one thing. But if, you know, they're suddenly getting your kid nice necklaces or a really nice um, radio or especially those things that are meant to kind of be worn and mark the child as I, you know, I don't, I obviously this is going to be from the assailant perspective, yeah. but marking it as a territorial thing. So that's going to be, you know, especially with bracelets, necklaces, stuff like that. Um, giving things that are, I guess, inappropriate of the situation. Um, and so obviously, you know, there are going to be adults who give your kids gifts because I was, uh, you know, I, I mean, I myself was moving out of an old apartment and I um, gave some bookshelves to uh, your, your daughter, you know, because I was moving and I needed to get rid of furniture. But, you know, if um, someone is going up to your child and, you know, being like, oh, hey, you know, I, it's, it's so good to see you again. Like, here's another gift and another gift and another gift. Um, you know, that can be a way of the assailant kind of buying the child's silence because if they are getting all these nice things, they may not think that they should say anything. Um, because, you know, especially in a child's mind, there's not going to be that immediate connection of this is absolutely not okay. I need to talk to somebody. Um, but yeah, stuff like that. Um, restricting the child's access to other adults. So, you know, if, um, it is someone taking care of your child who just really doesn't want anybody else to come over, um, anything like that. Uh, expressing unwanted attention to the child's sexual development is also something. Um, so, you know, pointing out secondary sexual characteristics of a child as they develop into puberty um, and that kind of thing. Not, you know, that's, that can be a warning sign. Um, sexualizing normal behaviors so um instead of you know normalizing sexual behaviors which may just be a part of you know your child's conversation with sex and you know conversation surrounding sexual behavior and sexual health um you know sexualizing anything that isn't normally sexualized um even just as a joke or a passing comment can be that kind of red flag to you um and another thing is trying to be a child's friend and confidant instead of an adult in their life. Um, you know, teaching the child that there is no difference between me and you um, because we are the same when there very much is. Um, so those are all, you know, red flags. Once again, one red flag does not mean that a child is being abused, but, you know, Definitely keep an eye out if you are if you're seeing multiple um, occurrences of like these things happening. Then you know it's something to look into whether it's your child who's being you know cared for by another adult and suddenly they don't want to stay with that adult anymore and that adult has been giving your child a lot of gifts and that kind of thing. Um, then that's something to approach, but um, just do it with the utmost care, especially when. Um, discussing it with your child because you know this is going to be a traumatic experience for them already and you don't want to make it even more of a traumatic experience from both sides of trying to help by forcing them to open up by taking away that autonomy of being able to talk to you freely mm -hmm. 
um but yes so that's that's that was kind of heavy but that was for all the um parents out there for the uh people who have children who they love in their lives um you know everything like that um a lot of those behaviors um i say a lot a lot of the uh, some of the behaviors rather um, that the child experiences when being sexually abused can also present themselves in adults in your life who um are being abused you know not wanting to be left alone with a certain friend suddenly um and not being as confident as usual being increasingly aggressive um suddenly not wanting to be touched um you know suddenly wanting to express themselves very sexually um you know those extreme changes in personality um especially in relation to sexual expression can be a sign um you know not wanting to remove clothing when going to you know the pool or something like that you know not wanting to be not fully covered up in front of friends um when that is out of the ordinary for your friend can also be a sign for adults um and that overly compliant behavior as well can present a lot of times with adults um especially if it is within um you know a close friend group or you know a previous partner um then that can present itself within you know their friends that they are you know their their other friends than this the assailant if the assailant has been in their friend group or kind of integrated in some way they could have overly compliant behavior with all the other friends as well because suddenly they're scared because this person that they deeply trusted has you know broken that trust and violated them and taken away that control and so it could be anyone and um you know that is definitely going to be a difficult thought pattern for those survivors yeah. solid information um if you do want any more information especially regarding child abuse um, and that kind of thing i definitely recommend you look at rain's website um, can I put a link in chat? Is that going to be immediately yeah. blocked? Um, if it is, you can just message it to me and I'll put it in chat. Okay. I don't think it'll get blocked though. All right. Um, this is, you know, warning signs for young children. That also includes, um, some of the warning signs for the adults who may be perpetrating this as well. Um, there you go. I wanted to touch on a comment I saw in chat earlier. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Jesus posted uh, about his reaction to finding out that um, you know, someone in his life was assaulted. And that is definitely something I wanted to touch on because, you know, as a support system to, you know, a survivor, whether that be you know, a super close friend or, you know, a very distant friend, a lot of people will feel immediate anger and immediate intense emotional reactions, especially if, you know, the guy or the girl who did this is one of your friends. Um, you may feel that immediate need to just go and show them a lesson. Um, so to speak, or to, you know, enact your own sense of justice. Um, and while, you know, those reactions are understandable, um, obviously if someone you deeply care about has been hurt and you are able to do something about it, you, you'll, you'll want to. Um, it's just that protective instinct that we all have with our people and, it's understandable, but we all need to recognize, you know, that the survivors should have a say in what happens. And also, um, especially in the experience of a lot of survivors that I've spoken to, um, through friends and clients as well, if, you know, say, uh, my best friend was assaulted and it, she was assaulted by some guy I knew very closely. You know, I knew where he lived and everything. And I wanted to go and beat him up. 
um, you know, that is essentially turning her story into his story of how, you know, someone came and hurt him. Um, and now it is putting that victimization on the assailant um, and letting them play that card, essentially. Um, and you know, as, as much as we may all want to show someone, you know, the reasons why we feel that what they did was wrong, um, especially with violent actions, you know, it's ultimately just going to cause more pain for the survivor, especially if um, the assailant has decided that they would like to report um, your actions on them. Um, because, you know, especially in situations where there's no proof of what happened to the survivor, and you want to do something because you want that sense of justice, um, then suddenly, you know, you just gave that assailant a free pass to, you know, basically play that victim card and make people feel sympathy for them because they're the one who was just suddenly beaten up or suddenly, you know, they're all their friends turned on them and they have no idea why. And, you know, they're the person you should feel bad for, um, which just not very helpful um obviously if you do come to a situation where you have a survivor with you and their assailant is also near you um if they're trying to do something you know, feel free to stop them um then but if it's just you know passing them in the grocery store or, uh, you know, seeing them out in public, you know, making sure that that survivor is okay in that moment is the most important thing. You know, if the assailant is trying to confront the survivor, um, which happens a lot uh, after the fact, um, a lot of assailants will you know, go to the survivor afterwards to try and continue a friendship of sorts or continue some sort of relationship especially as a way to keep the survivor quiet um and so you know making sure that there is that limited contact between the survivor and the assailant and making sure that the survivor is okay you know they're not um they feel safe they feel as though you know they have someone they can truly trust with them and they have someone who um respects their wishes of them not wanting to cause a scene. Yeah. Was there any other uh, topics we were going to approach? I think everything that I had thought of has definitely been approached, but I don't know if there's anything else you had. Um, I think I had... Okay, yes, I had one more thing just on some common... Um, I just wanted to talk about some of the common diagnoses and common impacts on survivors um, really briefly, nothing too complex, but um, something if you do know a survivor in your life, uh, a lot of them may be impacted by these most common diagnoses, um, which can include anxiety, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, eating disorders, and sleeping disorders. Um, you know, each survivor is obviously going to be impacted very differently by their attack and by their experiences and so these um, diagnoses and symptoms may not present themselves immediately. Um, some survivors may even feel as though what happened to them wasn't really an issue until later on in life or um, wasn't wasn't rape or wasn't sexual assault um, until you know one day they're thinking about it and they're like, oh, wow, that wasn't okay. And, you know, you know, this happened to me 10 years ago and I'm just now realizing it and just now approaching that. And so um, those things may present themselves immediately. They may present themselves later on after the fact. Um, and it's all part of the process and part of the reason that we want to encourage survivors to get the um, 
mental health services that are available to them and get the help that they need. And then the kind of last topic before, um, or I guess I should ask if there are any kind of lasting questions in chat um, before I go through to end on methods for overcoming anxiety um, regarding this. So if anybody does have anything that they'd like to ask, please feel free um, and I'll let us know so that we can go ahead and address that before we end the stream. Yeah, definitely. If there's any questions, anyone feel free to put them in chat and uh, mm -hmm. we can uh, cover the methods. And if there's nothing by the time we're done with that, then we can tie it up. And um, this entire episode will be posted on YouTube like every other one um, with the disclaimer so that if you have anyone that may uh, need this, this awareness or uh, if you want to go back and recap on it yourself, um, it will be available through that. Um, also, if anyone has any need for approaching help or anything, you can feel free to reach out to me. Um, I am definitely a direct link to Chris. Chris is also in my Discord and um, on my Facebook and shows up in stream every once in a while as well. So anyone that feels like they need to reach out, definitely, definitely don't hesitate. We're not, um, well, I guess I can't say we're. I'm not a professional by any means, but um, I'm definitely okay and comfortable with guiding you in the right direction of finding a professional to uh, get help. So. Yeah, and I mean, my my whole position with SARC is helping um, survivors uh, and, I mean, even friends and you know family members of survivors find resources to get the help they, they need or you know, we even answer some calls where it's just like, hey, you know, um, I think I have a friend who got assaulted. You know, what can I do to help her um, or what can I do to help them or what kind of resources can I provide to them? So if you have any questions for me after the fact um, or if you you know, need help finding resources or anything like that, you know, please feel free to reach out to me. Like he said, I'm in his discord. Um, I pop up in the Facebook live chats. And um, I am here to be a resource for everybody, um, especially in regards to sexual violence. But I also know a thing or two about <laughs> more um, mental health topics as well. So if you have any general questions about um, mental health, you can also reach out to me. But yeah, um, I guess I will go ahead and go through those methods for overcoming anxiety and kind of grounding yourself if you are in that spiraling. Um, you can also provide these to those survivors in your life um, who are experiencing this. But um, yeah, so I guess the first one I mentioned it earlier would be that five, four, three, two, one grounding technique. Um, once again, that's just going through the the senses, so five things you can see, four things you can touch, three things that you can hear, two things that you can smell, and one thing that you can taste. Um, just going through those things, and even if you're doing it by yourself, just saying it out loud and taking that time to um, make sure that you are grounded within your current moment rather than what your mind is creating um, is really important. That's the main sentiment behind all of these methods is going to be making sure that instead of getting into those obsessive thoughts, you're here and you're present and you are recognizing your current situation. Um, so another thing is going to be breathing exercises. So you know, there are many different forms of breathing exercises and a lot of them are going to be you know, like uh, breathe in for four counts, hold your breath for four counts, breathe out for four counts, just to force your body to lower your heart rate and to help lower that anxiety um, by you know slowing your breath down. Your body will have that automatic reaction to help you lower that um, fight or flight response, essentially. And so there are plenty of you know little YouTube videos and stuff like that of different breathing exercises with different holds and different counts. Um, and also, you know, if you have certain smartwatches, they also have uh, features for those as well. Or you know, you can just count it out yourself. Um, four, four, four is a great way to start. 
Another method is categories. So this is not really meant to ground you in your current moment, but it's meant to just get your mind off of things, especially if your current moment isn't wonderful. Um, and so, you know, in situations where there may be anxiety caused by your situation, whether that's, uh, you know, returning to the place of the sexual violence or being in you know, the vicinity of an assailant or something like that, or just even having general fear. This is a way to kind of get out of those thoughts, but not necessarily put you here and present. Um, and so that's going to be um, categories. So that is basically just you know, picking a category, saying, you know, like in video games is your category. And then out loud or in your head if you are uncomfortable doing it out loud because you're in public um, listing off as many things within the category as possible um, for as long as possible um, so as to basically get your brain into working on a different issue rather than working on the issue of fight or flight and working on the issue of we need to be safe um, because these are all recommended for you to recognize that you know, getting calm and recognize that you are safe where you are. Obviously, before doing any of these, um, make sure you get to a safe space and make sure that you are in a space where you are surrounded by people that you can trust or where you are alone if you feel better doing that. Um, and the last kind of method for um, making yourself present is anchoring phrases. So these are basically just a set of phrases that you say every time you feel overwhelmed or feel like you aren't present, present within the situation. And so you know, for me, if I wanted to use an anchoring phrase, I could be saying something like, I'm Chris Gray Rodriguez. I live in Texas. I have a cat named Bluebell. Today is May 27th. I'm sitting at my desk in my home. There's no one else in the room. And just saying that to myself to remind myself that this is where I am. This is, this is the day. I'm not back where the pain happened. I'm not back where the bad experience happened. You know, I am in this current moment and I am me instead of I am something that happened to me. Um, and so that is kind of the methods that I wanted to suggest. Um, I am also going to link in the chat just the uh, a list of way more methods if uh, y'all need to use any or if any of those didn't sound great to you there are plenty more um, available and I am sure that you'll find something that works for you as well oh that's great yeah all right okay well um Chris definitely put a lot of uh, work and preparation to this. I, I appreciate you coming on and um, providing all this information and this atmosphere. It's definitely uh, something that probably caused a lot of anxiety for um, people knowing that we we're going to be approaching the subject. So everyone that did come hang out, even if you were just sitting and watching quietly, um, we appreciate you being here and being present. Um, and if you learned something then awesome if this was a lot of stuff you already knew then cool um this episode will be posted within the playlist for all of the confide cast episodes um and if anyone after this i definitely encourage um taking space and doing something that will allow you to um drain out any mental space that you need to recreate for yourself in whatever way that you need to do that and uh uh you know take take time to absorb all of this it's definitely a heavy subject you may not know how much it's affecting you um but uh especially with a lot of the the topics that we covered i think that uh some of you may not realize how much this would have affected you before and after watching and if anyone does need to reach out feel free to reach out to me. Um, and if you need to connect with Chris, you can reach out to me and I can get you connected with her as well um, mm -hmm. as far as resources go and getting help. But we appreciate you guys. We're going to shut the episode down now. Um, 
it's been good and next week will be a much lighter topic it'll be this sunday and i will see you guys on that episode thank you all for listening and hanging out and i really appreciate uh your time so yeah